okay, I'm not going to say hi, nothing. I'm going to tell you to come to Ignite. We are so excited to gather on Sunday night, um, this Sunday night, May 17th, 8 o'clock p.m. through Zoom, and um, we want you to come. It is our family meeting, and we are just excited to see you. We miss you. We are going to cover some really important stuff like how might the church reopen, when might it reopen, what is the church's current financial situation. There will be a, a time for you to ask questions and get some answers to those questions that you have. Um, but more than anything, to gather together and kind of share stories of how we have seen God moving among us even in the midst of not getting together um, and gathering in person. So um, if you're watching this on Monday or beyond, it's too late, and hopefully you were able to come to that, and it was a blessing to you. Um, but here's how you get to Ignite and that Zoom link. You can go to brookviewchurch.com anytime on Sunday, and you'll click on that Ignite Zoom link, and it will have instructions for you. If you are facing um, Wi-Fi, internet, computer troubles, there's also an option for you to be able to call in to that meeting, and you'll be able to interact through your phone line. Um, we will hear you and whatever you say, and you'll be able to hear everything that's going on. It just won't have that video portion to it. And so um, if you are struggling also and you just need someone to help you troubleshoot, there will be a phone number on that that you can text or call as well. And we would just like to help you get into that meeting as much as possible on Sunday night. So we hope to see you there. Um, on Sunday night, yeah, last Sunday night, I got a text from somebody at Brookview that said, look at the pantry. This is awesome. And the shelves were just packed with stuff. You'll see that there's some clothing items there, and we just moved those because um, we want that to be a place for just food right now. Um, but those shelves were packed, and I was like, ah, I can't see everything. I want to go and just like get a zoomed-in picture of all that stuff. So I came to the church on Tuesday, and this was the photo. Very different. Um, a lot of things were gone. It was no longer packed, and um, I um, realized in that time that I was kind of organizing things and putting some of the clothing away and toys that were there, um, moved them inside the building. We had five people come through, and they were even more bare after that. And so for those of you that have come and donated and you're dropping stuff off, clearly that is a need that people are having, and they're showing up, and you're helping. And so I just want to celebrate you and um, just thank you for your generosity in this season. Again, every week we extend this to our Brook few family as well and say if you are struggling right now and food would be a blessing to you we want you to come there are no cameras surveillance nothing just come and take whatever you might need um, and if you're in a place where you just feel like you want to donate um, we'd love to to take give your donations to the community and any excess that is there at the end of a week we take and set it aside for our um, partners in this community that we work with vision house as well well as the Nourishing Network. Um, we love it when you guys fill out your online communication card, and so we just want to invite you to do that and to respond on that with prayer requests, comments, um, things that you'd like to be a part of that maybe you've heard in the announcements, questions that you might have, anything. If you want to communicate with us, please go to brookviewchurch.com, click on contact, and fill out the online communication card. Um, I hope you have a great week, and I will step aside for Jason. I want to start today with a question. Don't answer out loud. Just hold the answer in your mind. What is your biggest pet peeve? 
What's your biggest pet peeve? What's the one habit or behavior that just drives you crazy? For most people, their biggest pet peeves involve something that they value deeply being violated. For instance, those of you that know Jen, and if you don't know Jen, she's the lady that just gave announcements, you know that she loves, she deeply values efficiency. She really values the maximizing of time and productivity. For her, a dream day would simply be conquering her entire list, like actually getting everything done that is on the list for the day. That would be like an amazing day. And so you know what drives Jen crazy? When someone wastes her time. One of her biggest pet peeves is when we're driving somewhere and we're in the carpool lane and the person in front of us in the carpool lane is driving slower than the other lanes. Her mantra when this happens is, just because you can drive in the carpool lane doesn't mean you have to. If you want to go slow, get over. <laughs> right? So our, our pet peeves often stem from the violation of something we value. You, you want to drive a neat freak crazy? Leave stuff out of place. You want to drive a musician crazy? Sing off key. Right? Clap out of rhythm. Um, like artists and musicians, they deeply value beauty. So if you want to drive them crazy, then take a beautiful piece of music or work of art and wreck it somehow. Our, our pet peeves usually flow out of our values. So here's a question. You ever wondered what, what God's like biggest pet peeve is? You ever wonder what it is that just drives God crazy? Well, actually, there's a pretty clear answer to that, and it's this. Mistreat a human being. Mistreat a human being. Damage a person. Violate community. Use somebody. Free somebody out. Ignore somebody. Hold a grudge. Spread gossip about somebody. Damage somebody with your words. Hold back speaking the truth to somebody that really needs to hear it. Pass judgment on somebody because of their appearance because of the way they look or their race or their gender. Ignore people that are in need that you could help. Like keep finding ways to spend more and more and more on yourself and do nothing to help those suffering in poverty. It drives God crazy when he sees that stuff. Now we know this from places all throughout the library of scripture, but the reality of this smacks us in the face on the Sermon on the Mount. Like so much of what we've been studying is devoted to this. So much of Jesus' teaching is just about the way we treat people. And Jesus exposed those listening on the hillside that day to, to the very heart of God. He invited them to begin loving with like a radical kind of love. And for some of them, it felt shocking. In fact, it felt almost impossible. And so toward the beginning of his sermon, Jesus said, he said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, remember that little phrase there, the law and the prophets, because that's kind of like a bookend on a whole section of teaching for Jesus. It's like the first bookend. It comes toward the beginning of the message. And then Jesus teaches a bunch of stuff. And in a minute, we're going to get to the bookend in the back. But Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now, the law and the prophets, Casey gave an amazing message on this several weeks ago. The law and the prophets is essentially just the Old Testament. Jesus is referring to the scriptures as people knew them in his day. And he says, he's come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then he talks about what lies at the heart of the law and the prophets. And it's a lot of it is just about treating people right. It's about honoring community. In fact, Jesus says in several places, if you do that, uh, he says, if you don't do that, he says, if you don't do that, you, you face very serious consequences with God. And this is kind of woven all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you judge other people, then what? Then you'll be judged. 
Um, he says, if you refuse to forgive others their sins, then your Father in heaven will, will not forgive your sins. He says, if you're filled with hatred toward other people and it just leaks out of you and you say stuff like raka, which I've never said, but it means like you fool, you idiot. He, Jesus says, if you, if you get that angry and you treat people that way, then you can't participate in the kingdom of God. So Jesus says, look, the heart of the law and, and the prophets is pretty simple. God loves people. God loves all people. Therefore, when anybody gets careless in the way that they treat people, it drives God crazy. So Jesus comes to the end of this whole section that we've been studying over the last several weeks. And by the way, we've kind of bounced around the Sermon on the Mount because when COVID happened, we're like, hey, we think there are certain topics within this Sermon on the Mount that are more relevant than others. So we've kind of been bouncing all over the place. But we, in this whole section that we've been covering, we kind of come to the other side of it. And Jesus sums up all of his teaching on the Law and the Prophets. He, he encapsulates the entire thing with a single sentence. And this sentence contains some of the most famous words ever uttered in the history of the human race. This is an amazing sentence. We call it the golden rule. And it goes like this. Do unto others what? As you would have, done to you. As you would have, have them do to you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus puts it like this. He says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. And then he says, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And there's that little phrase again. Now it's the bookend on the other side of all the teaching, the law and the prophets. This is the bookend at the end of all of this brilliant teaching by Jesus on the heart of the Father. And this is why the golden rule is so, so central to everything that Jesus said. It's not some nice, like, little random saying that gets worked into the Sermon on the Mount somewhere. The point is that it sums up the whole deal. It is the whole deal. Jesus is very, very concerned because by his day, people had reduced the law and the prophets, the Torah, the Old Testament, the scriptures of the day into legalisms and kind of like superficial behavior modification. But they had forgotten, they had lost the most important thing, which is simply loving people. They'd missed the whole point. So Jesus says, I may not follow all the little rules that you guys have made up, and my teaching may sound a little different from what you're used to hearing, but don't think I've come to abolish what the law and the prophets are all about. I have come not to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. I've come to show you the heart behind them. And then he launches into the most brilliant teaching about radical love, what true spirituality looks like lived out. And that's what we've been looking at these past few weeks. Stuff like how do you deal with anger and, and jealousy and bitterness? How do you handle the human tendency to judge other people? How do you deal with, with people that mistreat you? What do you do when people aren't good to you? And so on. And then he comes to the end of all of this, and he says, and now I want to summarize the whole thing in a sen single sentence that everybody can take with you. This is the summary of all the law and the prophets. He says, think of all the ways you wish other people would treat you. And it's very simple. You treat other people that way. And we go, wait a minute. Really? It's that simple? Yes. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's more complicated than that, right? Nope. And, and Jesus, Jesus says, you want to know the essence of what God is calling you to do and be? You want to know what God's will is for your life? It's this. Become a golden rule person. Live a golden rule life. Learn to apply the golden rule to every situation, to every person that you encounter. Put yourself in the other person's shoes and ask, if I were that person, how would I want to be treated? And then go do it. Become a golden rule person. When we started the, this series, we looked at the backdrop for Jesus' sermon. He had been traveling all over Galilee and, and all over Judea, teaching the same thing again and again and again. He'd go from place to place to place, and he'd heal people. Every time he would heal people, and then he would do some teaching. And the essence of his message was always the same. He would say, repent, 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And we saw that for Jesus, heaven was, was not like some far-off, distant, future place. For Jesus, the kingdom was a very literal dominion or sphere, and it's that realm where everything is as God wants it to be. And Jesus insisted that heaven itself had come near, that heaven can come to earth. Now, how does that happen? Well, it has a lot to do with the golden rule. Because when people live out the golden rule, heavenly things happen. On Mother's Day, I was talking to Jen's stepdad, and I, like, I had my mind blown. Um, our daughter, Kate, is actually Caitlin Elizabeth Huguenin. And uh, so her middle name is Elizabeth, and it turns out she's named after someone very special, a person connected to Jen's side of the family. And it's a story that I had, uh, like, forgotten until uh, last weekend. Now, you'd think that when your kids are named after someone, that would be really special and important, and you would know the story. Uh, no. Uh, I knew that Kate's middle name had some sort of significance to somebody somewhere at some point. But honestly, I couldn't tell you what it was until last Sunday. And man, you guys, it is an amazing story. So let me tell you, let me tell you what's cool about my daughter's middle name um, since I just found out. Um, and this is awesome. So here, here's the story of Elizabeth. And I think this is just beautiful. Elizabeth Van Gelder was born in 1929 in Bellingham. And she was born with her umbilical cord wrapped around her neck, and it led to brain damage, and it led to cerebral palsy. Although she could walk as a child in, in her later years, she was confined not just to a wheelchair, but to, to like a wheelchair bed. She had to lay in a bed because her back was all twisted, and her wrists were atrophied, and her hands were just kind of in, and she was unable to, to straighten up or, or hardly move at all, so she just had to lay in this bed, and she needed somebody to come alongside of her and aid to help her eat, to help her dress, to help her go to the bathroom, to help her do anything. And every day, she would lay alone in her bed, and it would be parked on the front porch of the rest home that she lived in so that she could just sort of watch the world go by. So sometimes people would, would see her, and they would walk up and say hello and try to start a conversation, but it normally wouldn't last very long because the cerebral palsy made it very difficult for her to talk. And so most people wouldn't be able to understand her, and they would just give up, and they would walk away. Okay, so how did our daughter get named after this woman? Um, she's not a part of our family. She's not an aunt. She's not a cousin or anything. And this is where the story gets kind of crazy. The story continue, uh, like connects to our family through um, Jen's stepdad, Marty. So when Jen's stepdad, Marty who's now about to retire, whatever age that is, and you can figure that out for yourself. Uh, when he was 18 years old, um, he had a girlfriend named Angie, who was also 18 years old. And Angie lived close to Elizabeth's rest home. And so when Angie was 18 years old, on Sundays, Angie would, would walk to church. Every Sunday, she would walk to church to teach Sunday school. And her route took her right past the rest home, uh, where Elizabeth lived. And one day, as she walked by, Angie noticed the wheelchair bed on the porch. And she also felt the face in the eyes of the woman in the bed following her. And something inside of her, um, maybe the Holy Spirit, told her to stop. And so Angie went up on the porch, and she met Elizabeth. And something amazing happened, and they, they became like friends. So every Sunday morning, on the way to church, Angie would stop by the rest home, not just to visit with Elizabeth, but she would actually get Elizabeth, and she would push that, wheel, that bed on wheels all the way half a mile to church with her. And, and then at the end of church, she would push it back another half mile. Now, this, again, this was not Angie's aunt or grandma or a relative or anything like that. This was a strange woman that she saw from the road one day. But God stirred, like, compassion in her for Elizabeth. And she looked at her and she thought, you know what? If I were her, this is what I would want someone to do for me. And then she actually did it every week. 
She'd push Elizabeth the half mile to church on her bed because she wanted her to hear the music. And she wanted her to hear the message. And she wanted her to meet people. And then when it was all over, she'd wheel her back home. And you think about, I'm just like, what an incredible gift Angie was. Elizabeth had a, a mom who dearly loved her. And, and then she had the people at the rest home that loved her and cared for her. But she really didn't have much else. And here God had sent her this like 18-year-old angel. Now, I don't know what you guys were doing when you were 18. But I know what I was doing, and it was nothing like that. Okay, still though, how did our daughter get named Elizabeth? Okay, she's not family. She's, she's, she's not really even connected to our family. Here's, here's where the story takes a really unexpected turn. For two months, Angie poured herself into Elizabeth. She took her to church every week, and she spent time with her. And she was just an angel to her, really. But two months later, Jen's stepdad, Marty, and Angie, these two 18-year-olds, they were dating, and, and they decided to go tubing in the snow. And there was a terrible accident, and Angie was killed. And it was one of those unexplainable tragedies. A beautiful 18-year-old girl with a heart of gold, dead. And so as you can imagine, Marty, Jen's stepdad, was absolutely reeling with the sudden loss of his girlfriend. But in the midst of all of his grief, Marty got a nudge from God. One day, he drove by, just happened to be driving by Elizabeth's rest home. And there on the porch, all alone, was Elizabeth on her bed. Marty had never actually met her. He'd only heard about her from his girlfriend who had just passed away. But as he was driving by that day, he saw her there and he was touched. And so he, he parked the car and he walked up on, on the porch. He sat down next to Elizabeth and he introduced himself. He explained that he was Angie's boyfriend. That, that he knew that Angie had cared about her very, very much. And that he too was really sad that Angie was gone. And man, I like, I can't imagine that conversation. But Marty says that what happened next was just like God's leading. He got a clear sense from God what he needed to do next. So he took Elizabeth's hand, he looked her in the eye, and he vowed, from now on, everything Angie was to you, I will be. He was... He was 18 years old when he made that vow. For the next 13 years, he honored it. And every weekend was a new adventure with his new friend, Elizabeth. So Marty would come to, to the rest home and he would get her with his friends um, and you, you still get to imagine this, right? A bunch of 18-year-old punks rolling into a rest home. And they would take her places that she could have never imagined going. Um, they had a van. Somebody had a van that could fit her whole bed in the back. And so they would load her in the van, and they would strap down the bed, and they would strap her down. And then they would take her to all kinds of, like you guys, all kinds of crazy, uh, crazy, crazy places, and what, the, what they would do is they would just hoist her up on their shoulders and they would just carry her wherever they were going. So you here's, get the picture, a pack of 18-year-old boys carrying this woman all over town, like all over Bellingham and Linden and Ferndale and all over Whatcom County, which is just awesome to me. But the thing is, they didn't just take her to like easy places. They took her to some crazy places. They took her to the Linden Fair. And they walked around the fair, and it was too bumpy and stuff. You know, so they just hoisted her up, and they carried her around the Linden Fair for hours. Um, they took her on hikes with them. They, like, I mean, they took her on a hike to go see Whatcom Falls, um, this beautiful waterfall. They just, they really wanted her to see it. Like, you need to see this. So they carried her up all through the trails and up all through the woods, and, and, and they took her to see Whatcom Falls. Then they took her to church all the time, and they took her to ice cream shops. So every weekend, Marty went and picked up Elizabeth, a disabled stranger, 
and to whoever wanted to go with him. And he would just invite like anybody, you know, any of the gang, whoever wants to go with me, let's go. And he was like, let's go. And they would go get Elizabeth and go on some kind of adventure. And you guys, he did that for 13 years until, it was, until Elizabeth passed. When Marty was 31, her, her body finally gave out. And um, this week, he sent me a, a picture of Elizabeth with her mom and a nurse. So this is her, um, I don't know at what point, um, this woman here is a nurse from the nursing home, and that's, and that's her mom. And I can't imagine having that be my child, and that just, it's just staggering to me. So for 13 years, from 18 years old to 31 years old, and just like he was so young, but every weekend, Marty treated this woman like a princess. He treated her like a princess. Like, well, again, what was I doing in my 20s? I, I don't know. Not that. For 13 years, he stepped into a life and he brought as much joy as he possibly could. For 13 years, he gave this woman something to look forward to again and again and again. And as he told me the story last weekend, he kind of laughed. And he said, he said, you know, we were, we were young and pretty dumb. And we, we took her to some places we probably shouldn't have. Um, like that trip to Whatcom Falls, like up on our shoulders, that was kind of iffy. That, that, got, that got a little sketch, and I'm not really sure what we were thinking. But I, I was a young punk, and I lacked judgment. I, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I did the very best that I could in those years. But he also said that the more time that he spent with her, the more he could understand her. And in time, he, he came to be able to, he learned to speak Elizabeth. He said, um, and everywhere she went then, she loved to talk with people. And that became possible because she had him there to translate. And just like, how amazing is that? It's so beautiful. And so when Elizabeth died, um, her mom was so grateful to Marty for, for everything. And so she gave uh, Marty Elizabeth's most prized possession, which was her jewelry collection. Because Elizabeth loved beautiful things. She loved to feel beautiful. Um, Jen was 11 when Elizabeth passed, and Marty passed some of her jewelry on uh, to Jen because Elizabeth's fingers were very, very small, and so her rings really could only fit a child, and so Marty passed some of those on to little Jenny. And so, Kate, that is why your middle name is Elizabeth, which for me is good to know. <laughs> Uh, this total stranger became a beautiful part of the family, and her life was deeply enriched, at first by a stranger named Angie, and then this guy that you know as Grandpa Marty. When he was 18 years old, he saw a disabled woman on a porch all alone, and he asked a very powerful question. If I were that person, how would I want to be treated? And that, plus, that question, it led to the most amazing adventure. When people live out the golden rule, heavenly things happen. And I think we know this. We know it and we believe in it. And, and like, I don't know anybody that's like, no, nah, the golden rule sucks. I mean, like, the, the golden rule is like, we, we love it. So you got to ask them, well, like, why don't we live it more? And I think the problem is we just get so consumed with how we want to be treated. We get so consumed with our own agenda for our life. We're so worried that we're being mistreated or we're being ignored or we're missing out, that we're being left behind. And in all of that self-absorption, we, we miss these golden rule moments that are sitting before us all the time. John Orberg pastor that I love tells a story about a journalist friend of his. Says he got his first job writing for the Buffalo News, and his first job in journalism was writing obituaries. But after a little while, he started to get pretty discontent and pretty frustrated with this, this role as a journalist. He thought, you know, I could be doing like Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporting, and I'm, I'm stuck doing obituaries. And so one day, he, the frustration reached a boiling point, and he marched, like, marched into the editor's office and asked him, 
Why, why am I, when am I going to get some like decent story assignments? And the crusty old editor growled and said this. Listen, kid. Nothing you write will ever get read as carefully as what you are writing right now. You misspell a word, you mess up a date, and a family will notice and a family will be hurt. But you do justice to somebody's grandmother, to somebody's mom. You make a life sing, and they'll be grateful forever. They will put your words in laminate. And the writer later said, wow, like, I really never thought of it like that. After that, I pledged I'd make the extra calls, I'd ask the extra questions, I'd go the extra mile to write obituaries that deserved to be laminated. He took the golden rule and applied it where it had not been applied before. Write obituaries for others as you'd want others to write an obituary for you because someday somebody will. Then this guy started writing golden rule obituaries and it led to all kinds of, of adventures in writing. But the wonderful thing about the golden rule is that at any moment, at any time, any place, any job, any setting, any interaction with another human being, could be riding, could be riding a bus, could be grocery shopping, any moment could be a golden rule moment. Like you don't need to have a super high IQ, you don't need a lot of money, you don't need a title, you don't need anything. In fact, sometimes those things actually get in the way because they make me think that my life is actually all about me. And they keep me from simply asking, what would, what would I want if I was in this other person's shoes? Jesus is inviting you and me to go on a golden rule adventure. I mean, how would we describe the essence of what it is to walk with Jesus? It is to go on a golden rule adventure, to have our entire life revolve around the golden rule. Every interaction, in every conversation with our spouse, in the way that we listen to a friend who needs an ear, the way that we respond to people on Zoom for our life group, in a conversation with a, a mask-wearing clerk at Safeway, to not just respond in, in kind of this me-centered autopilot and have everything be about my hopes and my dreams and my wants and my plans and what I need and what I want, but like everyone else is somehow just a supporting actor in my movie. But to not do that, to instead pause and take time to notice another person to take a moment and think, what's, what's their story? What's going on with them? What's her home, hope? What, what's his dream? Okay, and then think, what would I want if I were in that person's shoes? And then use the imagination and creativity and initiative that God's given you. Part of what's cool about a golden, right life, uh, golden rule life with God is that it is not some legalistic checklist kind of deal. It's not something that you just like cross off when you've done it. It's an endless adventure that requires empathy and thought and creativity. And here's the really cool thing. Your adventure is completely unique to you. No one else can or will ever do it the same way that you do. Before, I, uh, before Jen and I started Brookview many, many years ago, we, we had to go to this thing called a church planter's assessment. So before we could get the backing of our denomination, they wanted to know that we were qualified. Imagine that. And so... We joined 10 other couples at this retreat center down in Oregon, in Canby, Oregon. Happened to be the week of September 11th to put this into, you know, 2001 to put this into a time frame for you. We're at this thing called the Church Planters Assessment. And we were with 10 other couples that wanted to start a church somewhere. And so we spent a week doing all kinds of interactive exercises. All of us that were going to be lead pastors had to preach uh, short sermons, and then we had to all work in teams, and then we had to plan and, and present stuff and work in groups and all of that. But the whole time, as we're doing all of that, th there were all of these evaluators sitting around on the edges of the walls evaluating us. And they evaluated everything. How, how well do these people work in groups? Um, you know, do we dominate a group, or are we too sensitive? Um, how do we interact with our spouse when we're working together with our spouse on a project in a group? What does that look like? What does that dynamic look like? Are we able to articulate our ideas clearly? 
Do we know how to encourage other people and be inviting in a group setting? What, what do we do if our idea doesn't get chosen or if our idea gets ignored? How do we respond to that? And these people would sit silently on the outer edges of the room just listening in, and then every once in a while they would write something down, which was really, really unnerving. So awkward. So at the end of the week... The assessors all met together in some hidden chamber somewhere, and, and, and then they decided what was going to happen, and they, they would put together a formal written recommendation for every single couple, and um, the evaluation for everybody came in three, kind of like three grades, okay? You could get three grades. The first was a green light, uh, which meant we think this couple is ready to start a church, and we give them our like unreserved recommendation, and that... The, uh, uh, the couple that would get a yellow light meant we think this couple certainly could potentially start a church someday, but they need to learn and grow and they need some stuff to happen before they're ready. Or a couple could get a red light, which meant, in our opinion, this couple is just not wired or gifted to endure the rigors of planting a church. So on the last day, after a week of all this evaluation with September 11th happening right in the middle of it all, we were going to all get our final reports. And for each of us, our sending agency, whoever our sending agency was, who paid for this thing for us, our deno what, like whatever denomination we came from, would also get a copy of this evaluation. And our support and our uh, alignment with that particular denomination would be contingent upon it. So the guy running the assessment gathered us all in a room. But before we each got our report, he prayed for all of us which was a good thing because um, we needed it. And he reminded us that whether we, we start churches someday or not, each of us has a, a meaningful role to play in our world. And then he read a poem that rocked me. Now, I'm not really a poem person. I'm really not. Uh, but I was stunned by it. And I think it was just the intensity of that moment in, in my life, but... It really hit me, and I've, I've shared this a few times over the years. The last time I did was at the memorial service of a very good friend, and many of you were there for that, so I know that many of you have heard this. But this is a powerful reminder of the uniqueness of every single life. Dorothy Williams writes this. She says, think about yourself. Think about what a remarkable, unduplicated, miraculous thing it is to be you. Of all the people who have come and gone on, on the earth, Eve, Moses, Cleopatra, Socrates, Joan of Arc, Richard III, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Madonna, George Clooney, not one of them is like you. No one who has ever lived, not one who is to come, has had your combination of abilities, talents, appearance, friends, acquaintances, burdens, sorrow, or opportunities. No one's hair grows exactly the way yours does. No one's fingerprints are like yours. No one has the same combination of secret inside jokes or family expressions that you know. The few people that laugh at all the same things you do don't sneeze the way you do. No, no one prays about exactly the same concerns that you do. No one is loved by the same combination of people who love you. No one. No one before, no one to come. You are absolutely unique. Enjoy that uniqueness. You don't have to pretend in order to seem more like someone else. You weren't meant to be like someone else. You don't have to lie to conceal the parts of you that are not like what you see in anyone else because you were meant to be different. Nowhere ever in all of history will the same things be going on in anyone's mind, soul, and spirit as they're going on in yours right now. If you did not exist, there would be a hole in creation, a gap in history, something missing from God's plan for humankind. Treasure your uniqueness. It is a gift of God given only to you. Enjoy it. But share that uniqueness. No one can reach out to others in the same way that you can. No one can speak your words. No one can convey your meanings. No one can comfort with your kind of comfort. No one can bring your kind of understanding to another person. No one can be cheerful and lighthearted and joyous in your way. No one can smile your smile. No one else can bring the whole unique impact of you to another human being. Share your uniqueness. Let it be free to flow out among your family and your friends and people you, you meet in the rush and clutter of living wherever you are. 
The gift of yourself was given you to enjoy, but not to hoard. Give yourself away. See the uniqueness around you in each person you meet. See it. Receive it. Let it inform you or nudge you or inspire you or comfort you. The collection of unique, irreplaceable beings around you now has never been available before and will not be in quite the same way again. And so, dear, special, irreplaceable person, receive the gift of yourself and others. Notice the gift, enjoy it, celebrate it, and be very, very thankful. Here's the thing. Jesus is inviting you and he's inviting me to go on a golden rule adventure. But your adventure is going to be totally different from anyone else's. It's going to be totally different from anyone else's. And I want to point out something else. Living a golden rule life is so much richer than the alternative. Like if we're not careful, we can start to think of it like, like it's a sacrifice. Like, like, like it's a sacrifice. But the truth is, it's not at all. The truth is, if you choose to orient your life around the golden rule, you're going to end up with more love and more joy and more friendship than you know what to do with. Because that's the law of infer- inversion in the kingdom of God. Those who, who put themselves last are the ones who end up being first. As I talked with Jen's stepdad last weekend, and he shared with me the story of Elizabeth, it was so crazy because you could just see it in his eyes and in his face that his experiences with a disabled stranger brought him to life. Like he could have taken cruises or exotic vacations, he could have bought himself tons of cool stuff, but, but loving Elizabeth well was, was actually better than any of that. It was more valuable to him than any of that. And Marty is in his place where he's now on the verge of retiring. And like many, he's, he's kind of nervous about it. And so um, I just want to pause. Don't listen. This is just for Marty. But I just want to say, Marty, I love that you're listening to these sermons since the whole COVID thing started, first of all. Second of all, you are going to be a stud in your retirement years. You're, you're, you're a golden rule kind of guy, and your golden years are going to mean more time and more flexibility to just live out a golden rule kind of life. It's not going to be endless golfing or vacations or hours and hours of solitaire that are going to bring you to life. You're going to find ways, new ways, to love new people because you always do. So, I can't wait to see what that looks like for you. And I just want to tell you, man, go crazy with it. Go nuts with it. And I want to say something to the rest of us. I don't know about you guys. I'm tired of sheltering at home. Amen. Amen. I'm tired of things that I want to do not being available to me. And here's the thing, when I start to like really think about it a lot, it starts to wear me down. But here's what I have come to know over the years. The more I focus on myself and all the things that I want, all the things that I can't have right now, all the things that I used to have, all the things that I'd hope to have by now but don't, the more I focus on that stuff, the emptier I become. The only way out of that pit is to begin to look Elsewhere, the only way is for me to take my gaze off of myself and to start actually seeing the people around me and asking, what are they going through and how can I help? Now, if you've been around Brookview for, for very long, you've probably heard me say something. And it's this, if, if you want to be filled up, if you want to be filled up, find a way to pour yourself out. If you want to be filled up, you have to find a way to pour yourself out. Happiness is a slippery thing. Happiness cannot be attained by chasing after it directly. It's a weird thing. The more concerned I am about my own happiness, the farther from it I find myself. If you want to be happy and you chase your own happiness, it will just slip through your fingers again and again and again. 
If you want to be unhappy and you want to be empty, then put all of your focus on you. But if you want to be filled up, find a way to pour yourself out. And this is simple, right? But this is the battle. Man, this is the battle. And I will tell you this, I get this wrong all the time. I know this. I talk about it. I teach on it. And I get it wrong all the time. Now, thankfully, God has given me children to remind me of this great truth. And recently, Brooklyn has been inviting me to pour myself out. She's like, Dad, you should pour yourself out. And she's what she'll say. She'll say, Dad, wouldn't you be happier if you served and poured yourself out by giving me the remote? <laughs> she says that. She seriously says that. And I want to tell you guys, it's stinking annoying. <laughs> and so I say, shut up, Brooke. We're going to watch reruns of the Mariners from the 90s because there's no sports on right now and I'm kind of sad and I need to be happy. So in order to be happy, I need to watch my Mariners and I need to watch them win, which means I have to watch reruns from the 90s. <laughs> I have to watch reruns from stinking 1995. <laughs> so I just want to say, I, I'm not some head in the clouds kind of guy. I, I live with this tension every moment of my life just like everybody else. And I'm not telling you that I get this right all the time, but I am telling you that if you want to be happy, if you want to be filled, you have to find a way to pour yourself out. And I'm not talking about like the one big thing I do in my life or the one big thing I do once a year. I'm talking about consistently, daily, moment by moment, finding a way to pour yourself out. This is the great reversal. To be filled up, you have to pour yourself out. And I think this is what Jesus was getting at when he said, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What does that mean for you? I don't know. Like, how do you start? I don't know. Where do you start? I don't know, but I know this. One of the best things you can do for yourself is stop focusing so much on yourself. So in everything you do, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets.